Okay, Alexander, we have a developing story uh, with regards to the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine. And it, uh, it appears that uh, we may, we may be looking at a second front opening in this war. And that front may be opening in uh, Moldova, in the frozen conflict uh, of a region called Transnistria. And uh, there's, there was a terrorist attack there this morning. It took out uh, two radio antennas that were broadcasting Russian media. And uh, we, we are hearing a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk, especially from the Ukraine side of things, that uh, the Ukraine military is planning an offensive in, uh, in Transnistria. They're going to be doing it. And this is, this, this is where it gets a little foggy. They're going to be doing it in cooperation with Moldovan military. However, that military is actually Romanian soldiers. I want to say kind of in disguise, but they're kind of hiding their status. This is where it gets a little, I mean, once again, I, I'm not going to confirm any of this, and this is just what we're hearing. But I think we should take these threats seriously, because if Ukraine, along with the Moldovan slash Romanian uh, soldiers are ready to uh, mount some sort of uh, of an attack in Transnistria, where you have uh, a Russian peacekeeping force, where you have a population that uh, that has a large uh, demographic, which is Russian and Russian speaking, and where coincidentally you have one of the largest ammunition depots in Europe, where Ukraine is desperate to get a hold of some sort of ammunition. And this would be a big, uh, a big win for the Ukraine military if they can do that. Not to mention that it, it opens up uh, a whole new front, which many experts are saying Russia can't defend against. Once again, I don't know if Russia can defend against it or not, but um, you know, there's a lot of different moving pieces here. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense has come out with a statement and pretty much said, don't you dare do it. Don't do it. Don't open up this, this front. But We'll see. The the Alensky regime is getting very, very desperate. So what do you make of everything that's happening in uh, in Transnistria? By the way, the government in Transnistria, the, this, this uh, frozen conflict, this breakaway republic, because it's not recognized by, not even by Russia, but this uh, this government, they have convened uh, special meetings to, to try and, uh, and nip this in the bud so it doesn't escalate or get out of hand. Yeah. So we'll see. Yes. And, and I understand there's also people in Moldova itself, in the government there, who are extremely alarmed by the situation and who also don't want the war to be ex extended, essentially, into, into Moldova too. So, you know, it is a very complex picture indeed. But you're absolutely right. The, the, the background to this is that despite, our, you know, after weeks of triumphalist propaganda, we are now starting to get the sense from Ukraine that things are going desperately and hideously wrong. Now, um, you know, I was reading an article in Politico and it was describing the enormous amount of shelling that Ukrainian forces are coming under there, that they're finding it increasingly, that it's becoming impossible for them to keep up with the shelling and the pushes by the Russian military. And um, they are getting desperate about their situation in eastern Ukraine. And so the idea is we're running out of ammunition. We're running out of supplies. We're running out of oil. We have to find some way of turning this round. The way to do it is by internationalizing the war in some fashion, by getting hold of all that ammunition in that massive ammunition dump in Moldova. I should say this is old ammunition, most of it going back to, to the um, Cold War. So, you know, what kind of condition it's in is another, is another question. But, you know, they want to get hold of all of that. And also, perhaps, and this is perhaps the, lo the longer range plan, that they're hoping that if they can start this second front in Moldova, they can distract the Russians so they can break the Russians' focus from this war that the Russians are waging in Donbass, get the Russians to divert troops away from Donbass to trying to fight in Transnistria, wherever, whatever it is that the Russians might have to do, and hopefully interna internationalize the conflict 
in that kind of way. And so we've seen these attacks. There was an attack yesterday on the security, uh, the, 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 the headquarters of the main security um, unit in Transnistria, this break breakaway Russian-speaking region in Moldova. So there was a grenade attack on, tho on that, and then there was another attack on this radio station this morning. And the Ukrainians are barely concealing, they're not really concealing the fact that they were actively involved in all of this. Now, I, this is an incredibly dangerous strategy. I think that it will not result in the Russians easing off the pressure on the Donbass. But what it might do is it might cause Rus the Russians to intensify operations elsewhere in Ukraine. And a few days ago, a Russian general, General Minakayev, who is the deputy head of the um, central Russia's central military district, that's basically in the Urals and Siberia, and it covers most of the big Russian military industrial complex. He said that Russia was aiming to cut off Ukraine from the sea, essentially extend its land. And he was talking about extending the land corridor all the way to Transnistria. There's a big Russian force in Kherson region near Nikolaev. If troops start to be moved, Ukrainian troops start moving towards uh, uh, Transnistria, then I can see that the Russian forces there might start to get involved. If that brings them in conflict with Romanian troops, even if they're uniformed as Moldovan, that sets a, a NATO army fighting against the Russians. And of course, the Russians have all the means, have lots of means to strike way into Moldova and do all kinds of things there. I mean, it is an, it is an utterly reckless move. And would, one would devoutly hope that Western leaders are doing what they can, some Western leaders at least, are doing what they can to try and calm the situation and try to persuade the Ukrainians, you know, give up on all of this. Now, my concern is Blinken and Austin, the US Secretary of State and the US Defense Secretary were in Kiev. They had a meeting with the Ukrainian leadership there. If they gave the green light to this, then I, we are in very, very serious trouble. I'm hoping that the Ukrainians, as they often do, by the way, didn't actually discuss it with the US. Though I have to say, I do wonder about that. Well, I think this has been in the works for uh, at a minimum one week because uh, because of projection, <laughs> plain and simple. Uh, Zelensky came out literally like four or five days ago, and he said that uh, Russia is going to be attacking Moldova. He said they're going to be attacking another country, and he was referring to Moldova. And there you have the projection, which to me signaled that Ukraine is going to be doing something with regard to Moldova and Transnistria. The minute, the minute they're, they're, they're trying to blame you for something, you know that it's something that they're up to. You said that the Russians call it mirroring. Well, Zelensky hinted at the fact that Ukraine is going to be uh, making a move on Transnistria by accusing Russia of uh, having its eyes set on uh, Moldova. So I think this, is, uh, this has been in the works for, for the better part of a week. And I do believe that Blinken and Austin were in Kiev or Poland, depending on what you believe yeah, with regards yeah. to Zelensky's whereabouts. And uh, they, they greenlit this because... They really don't have any other options to play. I mean, the FSB in Russia is saying that Ukraine is so desperate that they're actually putting out uh, assassination hits and contracts on Russian journalists. Um, just incredible stuff that's, uh, that's coming out of the, uh, the Alensky regime. Um, to be fair, you're right. Moldova, the government of Moldova said that, uh, that they don't want any part of this war. What is uh, what is uh, Johannes Klaus Johannes of uh, Romania? I believe is the president. What do you think Romania is doing about this? Is Romania going to find a way to uh, to to off ramp this and to and to not get involved? Um, the trouble is, I mean, Romania, this, this would be a disaster for Romania. It would be a disaster for Romania. The trouble with Romania is, of course, that there's very very strong feelings in Romania about Moldova. I mean, Moldova is a Romanian-speaking country. In the period between the wars, the First and Second World War, it was part of Romania. And, you know, the Romanians have claims over Moldova. And they have 
you know, very strong feelings about Moldova. So even a Romanian government which wanted to stay out of the war might find it difficult to. I think it is an extremely dangerous situation. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, I've seen projections that if there's going to be a battle in Moldova, it will probably happen in May. In other words, we're not there yet. But, you know, um, I, I also get the sense the Moldovan government does not want to be involved in all of this. But, you know, it's very, very easy to see how things could get out of control, especially given the ongoing crumbling of the military positions of the Ukrainians in Donbass. And I'm going to just, you know, read here briefly. These are from Politico. Uh, and it talks about, you know, a, a Ukrainian commander uh, uh, saying that uh, they simply, do, that the, the Russians destroy everything with artillery, shelling day and night. He says that he's running dangerously slow on ammunition, that his troops are reduced to rationing shells. And he talks about how um, um, if things continue for much longer the way they are, he and his troops in Donbass are going to find themselves in the same position as the Ukrainian troops bottled up in the Azovstal factory in Mariupol. Now, that's one Ukrainian commander, but I'm sure it's representative of many. And, of course, if that's the situation, if that's how things are really shaping out, you can see that people in Kiev may be becoming increasingly desperate. And, you know, we can also see that there are people in um, Washington might be starting to get incredibly alarmed as well given the amount that the US administration has invested politically in Ukraine. Yeah, so the game plan is that um, they're losing on all fronts, the collective West, they're losing on the ground in Ukraine, they're losing the economic war as well. And so their Hail Mary pass, their last option may actually be to try and get a conflict in Moldova, bait Romania, into getting involved, and then you have your uh, your NATO Russia conflict right there. How do you think Russia can uh, can either one prevent this, or if it does happen, if this does break out, how do you think Russia will uh, will counter? I mean, will they will will we see missile strikes in uh, Transnistria, Moldova? Will we see Russian forces being deployed there? Does Russia have the capacity to deploy? Um, forces to to Transnistria. From what I understand, you just have freedom fighters there. It's not a very formidable Russian military presence in Transnistria. No, I, I, At least I, I, that's what I'm understanding. I don't know if I'm, I, I, if I'm I understand. Wrong about that. Do I you understand. see an asymmetrical, an asymmetrical Russian counter? For example, yeah. they start going after uh, Kiev or Lviv. Can, can I say straight away? Very hands off. Yes. Can I just say up? To, I I don't know. I mean, I'm not a military strategist. I would be I would be incredulous if the Russians haven't thought of counters, potential counters to this. And it could very well be that they have. Uh, and in fact, I'm sure that they have and that they've got various preparations. I would have thought missile strikes are, are a certainty. And yes, mainly these are, you know, fighters. But they're also, there are also actual Russian troops there. I mean, there is, a, there is, there is part of the Russian armed forces in Moldova, there by agreement, and you know that the Russians have a responsibility to protect it, and I, you know, I think that they can do. But you know what they will do, I'm not even, go I'm not going to try and guess. What does make me wonder, by the way, you know, if you go back a few weeks, about a week or so, I mean, there's still that very strange affair about the Moskva. You remember the cruiser, and you know, there's some reports that the Moskva was actually. Um, Closer to the Romanian coast than it was to the Ukraine to sorry, to the Romanian coast than it was to the Ukrainian coast, and I do wonder whether perhaps that incident with the Moskva might have had something to do with these developments that we're now seeing in Transnistria and with uh, with the situation in Romania. You know, I, I'm you know I'm not going to try and guess everything, but it does make me wonder whether you know this isn't a ominous picture which is now building up to some sort of crisis. I will say um, it reminds me increasingly of Vietnam and I'm going to explain how. When it became clear that the United States could not achieve its political objectives in Vietnam itself, in South Vietnam, 
what then started to happen is that the war started to expand into Laos and Cambodia. And eventually those two countries were drawn into the war. And I'm beginning to worry that the same is going to happen to Moldova. Yeah, but if Moldova gets drawn in, you run the risk of Romania getting drawn Absolutely. in, and then you run the risk well, of, Romania uh, as well. no. of, of Russia, NATO, yeah. Absolutely, yes. And then, of course, I mean, what, does, what does NATO do at that point? I mean, at that point... Well, what does Romania I, do? What will Romania do? What, but, you know, what will the other countries do? I mean, I don't know. Um, I would not be surprised if at that point we see a split. We start to see an actual split. Oh. And, and, and in, we start in NATO, to, you mean? In or? NATO, in NATO itself. And I mean, I also see an opinion polling in the US, which it's now quite clear that most Americans do not want to see American troops involved in this conflict in Ukraine. There were some early opinion polls that suggested otherwise, but the methodology of those polls has now been challenged. And the latest opinion polls make it absolutely clear that they do not want to be drawn into the fight in in. Uh, in Ukraine. Americans don't want to be drawn into the fight in Ukraine. So um, I can see a NATO split, possibly, but, you know, it, it does increasingly look like an increasingly desperate last throw. And I hope and presume that the Russians have some kind of game plan to deal with it. But, you know, I don't know what it is. Yeah. I mean, I just keep on coming back to the to the point that um, Blinken and Austin they green they greenlit this. The uh, Elensky regime has been planning this for a while because they just don't really have anything else left. And um, the Russians, absolutely, the Russians have game planned this out, and I'm sure they've got four or five different options and plans as to how to deal with uh, Transnistria and uh, and Moldova. Should uh, Elensky be crazy enough to do this? So, you know, you end up looking at, uh, at Romania and the Romanian government well, and you say, yes. do they have the strength, the guts to uh, tell NATO and the United States, uh, stop? Yes. Stop this. We're not, we're not going to get baited and goaded into this. Well, that's right. That's exactly right. I don't know. I really don't know. And, you know, it's also a question of what Moldova itself does. I mean, I understand that most people in Moldova do not want a war. <laughs> so, you know, there may, be, there may be political resistance in Moldova itself. I mean, you know, not Transnistria. I mean, in Moldova, the, the, the other parts of Moldova. So I, I don't know whether Romania will let itself be baited into this. I don't know whether Moldova will let itself be baited into this. Moldova up to now has taken a very neutral stance on the war by the way, at least overtly so. I mean, it's refused to impose sanctions on Russia, for example. So, um, you know, I, you know, it's complicated. But, you know, when you're, when you're desperate, when you're increasingly running out of options, when the military situation that you're facing becomes increasingly bleak, and when you have so much of your political capital, if you're a, the administration, invested in a particular outcome in Ukraine, you start being tempted to take dangerous risks. And I think this is perhaps the most dangerous. And, you know, we've been saying, we've been saying several times in programmes um, on this channel that, you know, as things get really bad, we could see the situation escalate. We could see an attempt by the administration, by the Western powers, to talk about, you know, sending peacekeeping forces in Ukraine. Maybe the plan is not peacekeeping forces in Ukraine. Maybe the plan is to escalate the war into Transnistria and Moldova itself. Yeah. All right. We'll uh, continue to monitor this uh, story. The Duran.locals.com, everybody, and go to the Duran shop. Use the code good day. Get 10% off all of our merch. There's the mug. Good day, mug. Take care. <laughs>